Um, look, thank you very much, Craig, for that introduction. I have quite a formal and prepared speech, which uh, I feel is not the appropriate thing. And it's just wonderful to be here amongst so many um, old, friend, old friends and I'm sure um, new friends. And Stuart, thank you, uh, as well as um, Karen, for inviting me to come along and share some thoughts with you uh, this evening. I've been asked to speak about um, uh, the connection between justice and peace and uh, put forward the proposition that you, if you don't have both of them, you have neither. Um, and um, uh, like I say, I don't give lots of very formal speeches, but I feel like I'd like to uh, at least attempt to do that tonight because I'm going to put this up on my Facebook page tomorrow, so I better assemble something <laughs> of what I said tonight. Um, and it's just wonderful to see so many people here. Um, the, of course, uh, it is a great privilege to speak, and I've had a long association as Stuart will probably mention or uh, would know, with the Sydney um, Peace Prize. I'm going to take that off. Um, with, with the uh, Sydney Peace Prize and, of course, uh, the, the centre. And while, as Frank said, in a sense we're saying goodbye to the Centre for Peace and Conflict Studies, it is just wonderful to see that the university community remains committed to advocating for peace and there is a reiteration or iteration um, of that centre of which why you're here tonight. I'd like to begin as uh, is appropriate and as I always do and I know that you all do as well by reminding ourselves that we're on First Peoples land um, and this of course where Sydney University is, is the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And I always uh, take a moment when we remind ourselves of First Peoples, but in particular everyone, the Gadigal, because it was the Gadigal that took the first brunt of British invasion um, and colonisation. And for that reason, I think it's important to take a moment. Um, and it's not me saying it, but so many of the Gadigal and the Eora, of course, um, uh, saw that invasion all but very briefly because it was really smallpox that decimated the Gadigal um, in those very early days, um, particularly in the first three or four months of the British arriving. I think also reminding ourselves when we acknowledge country, and I spoke at the uh, Lewisham Christian Brothers Boys School today, which is a massive school, um, and spoke about this. But we also have to remind ourselves, because I think sometimes the acknowledgement or welcome to country becomes a bit, you know, it's something you get through uh, to get the, the show on the road. But for me, it's a really important thing, and I'm glad, glad that Brian Ahrens is here tonight, because he was working with the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation. Patrick Dodson was the leader of that council, and it was Patrick Dod Dodson's vision and that council that brought back this incredibly ancient tradition of recognising and acknowledging country. And I think a lot of people don't know that story, but it's an important story and it has such a massive impact on public life in Australia today. And it wasn't so long ago. I'm very glad to see my old friend uh, Penny Craddock here tonight as well. Um, Penny, it's wonderful to see you and many, many others. I suppose, everyone, that uh, my basic proposition is this, um, is that uh, when you do an acknowledgement of country, it reminds us that although the frontier wars are all over in this country, in that bloody, horrid way, the massacres are in the past and the legal, explicit legal structures designed to exclude Aboriginal people are gone, it's important to remember that their effects remain very, very much in place. Not just with generations older than me, not just with my generations, but generations much younger. And in that context, I think in an audience like tonight, we can say that peace is not complete in the absence of justice. That peace is not complete 
in the absence of justice. And I think that most of you here today would agree that without justice for everyone, as a community, we are denied as well. I know that that's a fundamental principle that this, um, this organisation and that you're here, you're here to um, remind ourselves of tonight. I know it's an a friendly audience and that's kind of nice um, because I'm going to Parliament next week and it won't be so friendly. <laughs> I'm very pleased that uh, this council is focused upon peace with justice. Peace with justice. And that it recognises that peace achieved by sacrificing justice is not only hollow, it is inevitably weaker and much more fragile. In our country, this distinction is well worth considering. We have a history, and a very recent history, which makes this very um, important consideration. I said to the young men I spoke to this morning, uh, you know, the first 10 years of my life were spent uh, not being worthy enough to be counted in the Australian census. And that is a very recent history. And people, I think, lose to tend to lose sight of, the, of, of it, but the fact is that it is what the reconciliation process has actually been about. It has been about peace and it has been about justice, in particular about justice. Making ours a nation with, which is at peace with itself is what really reconciliation has been about. I do, do hope that the referendum that you will all be engaged in uh, very soon, some of you already, to recognise First Peoples in the Australian Constitution will take another step for us in terms of nation building. And you uh, can expect to hear a lot from me on that one as we move forward. But we often talk about the fact that the invasion or the settlement, depending on whether you are on the shore or on the tall ships in the middle of Botany Bay, the truth is either way, there was trauma attached to those events. And that trauma is not something that uh, some of our uh, naysayers can say, well, it's all in the past. It is not in the past. It lives with each and every single one of us. It is what has built, um, in many ways, the situation that we have today. I get so cross with saying, well, Aboriginal people have all these opportunities. Pull your socks up, get over the past, and get on with it. Well, you know as well as I do, that that is not how the world works, and it's not how we work as individuals, as human beings. The trauma is passed on from generation to generation. It is well and truly entrenched, made worse by historical government policies designed to break down history, kinship, and family structures and destroy cultures. And of course, many of the uh, senior Aboriginal people that you know, uh, that you mix with, uh, that are part of um, our great movement are people that have been directly affected, and I mean directly affected, by those policies of forced removal of Aboriginal babies and children from their families. In fact, uh, uh, that practice was still going on when I was a young girl, uh, still going on very much. The Wiradjuri Wars, and I'm a Wiradjuri woman, were two in number. And I remember just a few months ago driving through Wiradjuri country up the back of Dyington Point on my way to Narandra and crossing over a creek bed and the name of that creek was Murdering Island. Um, and uh, it would have been my direct descendants that gathered, uh, were forced onto that island and systematically killed um, some, some years before. These effects are real, everyone. They are born out of the statistics and more importantly, they are born out of the lived human experience of First Peoples. Mick Dodson, and it's an old quote, but it is one that I say as much as I can because it is about the, um, the fight for social justice. I think Mick said this in perhaps 1984 when he was the social, uh, 94 when he was the social justice commissioner. He said this, is what faces you in the morning. It is awakening in a house with adequate water supply, cooking facilities and sanitation. The ability to nourish your children and send them to school. A life of choices and opportunity, free from discrimination. 
And what better description have you ever heard of what social justice actually is? We see in the huge dis disparity between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal incarceration rates or life expectancies or education rates. All of those things you know, I won't quote the statistics. But what they do mean, everyone, is that more families are separated by the judicial system that does not recognise the circumstances of those who find themselves in it. It is inconceivable how we make up 4% of the population and yet in uh, juvenile justice systems across this country, in some parts of Australia, 100% of the juvenile justice population. 100% of the children removed and put into statutory child, uh, fa uh, stat statutory child protection. 100% Aboriginal. Can you imagine what the downstream effects of that is going to be? It means more mothers and fathers, uncles and aunts taken too early from their loved ones. But it also means more Aboriginal young people locked out of the education system that will give them the chance to break these cycles. And that is how nuts this is. It is fundamental and th that is a fundamental and systemic injustice. One as we as a community have to meet together but we are still so, so far from being at peace with ourselves as a nation. In 1997, the Reconciliation Convention in Melbourne, I think it was one of the most seminal, for many reasons, a uh, few days of my life. But Alex Borain was there, and um, Stuart, you'd remember um, um, Dr. Alex Borain. He was the deputy chairperson of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa at the time. And he spoke and he clearly laid out the path he saw towards a just peace. He said this, we cannot achieve reconciliation without the truth. However costly the search for truth and knowing the truth might be, it is of, it is of fundamental importance to base peace and unity on truth. An incredible, uh, uh, an in, an incredible minimum, an uh, irreducible minimum requirement for lasting reconciliation is the quest for truth. And that is what I really want to um, leave with you thinking about tonight, is our quest as a nation for truth. How much further have we got to go? And I think we have achieved a great deal. But Dr. Alex Borain went on to say this. This was part of what he deemed as the three anchors for reconciliation. The first was the art of truth telling, something that we, do, we today are traveling further towards um, in, our, in our country. But the second anchor, he said, was restitution. The third was the restoration of, restoration of the moral order. And that, to me, is something that we need to grapple with as a nation. When we talk about what justice means in our con own context, I think, honestly, it's something that serves us well. And, and the truth is, we aren't there yet. I have committed my entire life to that craft of truth-telling. It isn't news to anyone in this room that the social justice deficit exists, no doubt, if we haven't studied in one of the rooms in this place. And you've um, at least seen some of, it, some of it on the news. I always want to make the point that the notion of a just society doesn't relate only to the need to close the gap for First Peoples. While the malaise in Aboriginal affairs are creep back to paternalism and increasingly prescriptive government approaches to policy making, and that is our real challenge politically right now, let me tell you. I am seeing it up close and personal. A creep back to paternalism and prescriptive government approaches. But this search for a just society is also about the others that we've left behind, those who through no choice of their own. I know some of you are familiar with the work of the late and very great Tony Vincent. His work, particularly his Dropping Off the Edge series, demonstrated this issue most clearly. What it showed was that for a segment of our community, the barriers to full participation weren't only entrenched, they are growing. This is systemic injustice, and one of which our community should not tolerate. Unfortunately, in my view, the statistics belie the reality, and I'm almost finished. When these facts and figures, they are far easier in turn, to turn into salacious tabloid headlines about families of welfare bludgers and houses trashing their state-funded accommodation. 
than they are to distill into the reality of complex intergenerational disadvantage. Weak governments run on this populism because it's easy and it's politically popular. Watch next Tuesday night and listen. I think a good deal of this popularity comes from the fact that as a society, it is easier to not deny that we have any responsibility for these systemic injustices. Take the headline which ran in The Australian just yesterday, for example. 2% of the people receiving New Start, which is about 540 bucks a fortnight, um, uh, the New Start allowance, are allegedly rorting the system. Now, the government is going to spend millions on chasing uh, that 2%. I can't speak for all of them, but I think it's fair to say that at least some of those people who choose to subsist on the system are doing so because they don't have the tools to make any other choices. And how can you not understand that if you purport to represent people? This is what Mick Dodson was talking about, that the children of disadvantage really have a choice. So when we talk about making ours not just a peaceful society, but a just one, I would urge you all to consider this point. We are not just a society, we are not a just society, until we can say that all people do have a choice, a choice to educate themselves, to, to participate in their communities and the broader society. How can a just society possibly accept some parts of the community just by virtue of the circumstances in which they are born? Whether it is for Aboriginal or non-Aboriginal communities, we need to start being honest with ourselves. The land of the fair go has a fair way to travel, I think, and so does our bloody national anthem. For the Aboriginal community, I hope the referendum to see First Peoples recognised in our constitution will be part of that truth-telling. And finally, my friends, for the community more broadly, think a good, think a good place to start is a simple acknowledgement that not everyone is born with equal opportunity in this country. As Tony Vincent found so glaringly, one of the best indicators for your future outcomes is the postcode where you were born. How can that be in a first world nation? So if I may, if I make one point at, point at this launch tonight, Stuart, it is this. Don't stop seeking justice. This institution and those like it are vital to our search for a more just peace society and the discussion activities of the Sydney Council for Peace with Justice are going to be absolutely vital to our pursuit of truth-telling and a just society.